Now, I grew up being told that Christianity was all about having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm sure much was the same with you. And the older I've become, the more I've read the Bible, the more I've contemplated the theological realities of our faith, the more I've come to seriously question that little phrase, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So I have a question for you this morning. Yes, you, sitting out in the pew, what chapter and verse in the Bible does that little phrase come from? What chapter and verse in the Bible says a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? And here's the thing, it's a trick question. This phrase, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, doesn't appear in the Bible anywhere at all. So where did it come from? Why do we say it? Now, in all honesty, as best I can see it, it was passed around at revival services for the past 50 to 60 years or so as a summary statement of what the Bible teaches. But I firmly believe now is the time for us to put that little phrase into doubt. Is Christianity about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, or is that little phrase just part and parcel of the problem that the church has been facing for the last 20 to 30 years? Now, Easter has come and gone. You know that one holiday, we at least expect certain people to be in church, even if we, need, even if we don't see them the rest of the year, besides Christmas, that is. Are we okay with that? Are we okay with that? Now, maybe we should realize that according to the ancient church calendar, again, we're still in the season of Easter for the next seven Sundays. And this is the time of the year when we contemplate what it means to live in the light of Easter, to live in the light of the resurrection of our Lord. And if the best we can come up with is that it's about having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, well, that's just not cutting the bill anymore. We need a better understanding of what it means to live in the light of Easter. And believe me, we have one, right? We have the Bible, don't we? And if we're going to live in the light of Easter as Christians, as followers of Jesus Christ, I think it's time that we use the language that the Bible uses. So take the phrase, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, out of your Christian vocabulary for a moment. So let's take that phrase out for a moment. We're going to look into the first epistle of St. John this Easter season to find a better alternative. St. John writes this letter to encourage churches around Asia Minor that are struggling. Some people have left their churches. They came up with a false understanding of Christianity that was theologically deficient. They didn't understand the depth of sin. They didn't understand how Jesus could be both God and man. And then they had the audacity to claim that the churches that John was leading were not teaching the truth. Wow, that somehow sounds vaguely familiar to me. But John wanted to encourage his churches how to live in the midst of turmoil, how to live in the light of Easter. So let's take a look. Let's go to 1 John, the first chapter. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of truth. The life appeared. We have seen it and testify to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. This is the message we have heard from Him and declare to you, God is light and in Him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and we do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all 
unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now, if our claim, if our claim is that we need a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, then our biggest problem seems to be that we are just lonely people in need of a spiritual boyfriend. And that's not where John starts. That's not the problem that haunts us. Spiritual loneliness is not the worst reality that plays itself out in our everyday lives. The problem we all have is called sin. It's the problem that the false teachers who left John's church, they tried to downplay. Now, they're probably, they probably believed in some early form of the heresy that the church has known as Gnosticism. Gnostics believed that our, our fleshly bodies were bad, but our, our immaterial spirits, they were good. And the goal was, we have to escape the fleshly, earthly body. We have to escape it. Not by suicide, not by self-destruction, but by having some kind of secret knowledge that would help us ascend to the spiritual world, even while you still lived in your body on earth. But because you ascended to the spiritual world, nothing that your body did could be called sin. You just let it go, let it run free. You were spiritual. So if your body acted out on its sexual desires, if you ate too much, if you abused people, it didn't really seem to matter. Gnostics, of all forms, felt so spiritual that they were just, they were beyond sin. Even if their physical body partook in those things that Holy Scripture called sin. And this is why John writes that if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. If we claim that we have not sinned, we make Jesus out to be a liar and his word is not in us. And that if we claim to have fellowship with Jesus and yet continue to walk in darkness, we lie and we do not live out the truth. The false teachers who left John's church claimed to have fellowship with Jesus. But they also claimed that they do not sin, they have not sinned, they are not prone to sin. And yet by their own actions, they've proved themselves to be sinners. Most of all by the fact that they've broken the fellowship of the church. They've attacked those that they once called brothers and sisters. Look at 1 John 2, 9. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in darkness. Now the attitude and the mentality of those false teachers still exists in the church today. It may not be Gnosticism, but it really hasn't quite left us. And sure, we can think of the most pertinent example in our society and in our culture today. Life for American Christians has changed somewhat, since the Obergefell case that legalized homosexual marriage. But if you didn't see that coming a mile away, you just had your head in the sand. And to most conservative Christians, that's the only example that we seem to think about. So do I think that homosexual practice and the Orthodox Christian faith can be reconciled? No, I do not. And yet I don't see the conservative evangelical church reaching out in Christ-like love to a portion of the population with the highest suicide rate in the nation, sometimes because they've just felt utter hatred from those who've called themselves conservative evangelical Christians. So let's stop beating that horse for a little while. Let's take a closer look inside our own doors. Now, I grew up in the Church of the Nazarene. And if you're an old-school Nazarene, there was probably some point in your life where you reached what was called entire sanctification, meaning you were perfectly sinless. You couldn't sin. This is what they taught. This is what I was taught. Now that teaching always bothered me because I saw people who claimed this very state of sinless perfection partaking in the favorite sin of the church pew. Anyone know what that would be? Favorite sin of the church pew? Gossip, right? Gossip. Right? But they wouldn't call it gossip. They called it spiritual concern, right? I'm concerned about so-and-so because of this or that. I have news for you. That wasn't concern. That was gossip. That was slander. Oh, and by the way, St. Paul 
in 1 Corinthians 6 includes slanderers and lists of those who are barred from the kingdom of God. Yes, slanderers, gossips, they're lumped together with homosexual offenders, the sexually immoral of all kinds, the thieves, the greedy, the drunkards, the swindlers. If you don't find yourself somewhere in that list, you might be delusional. Or as St. John says, you might just be a liar. You're deceived. The truth is not in you. I did a little editing this morning because I found this quote and I could not keep it out of my sermon. This is from John MacArthur. He says, Jesus had little trouble reaching the harlots, the thieves, robbers, criminals, outcasts, and sinners of society, including the tax collectors and the extortionists. But he had an almost impossible time reaching the religious, self-righteous, moral people who were under the illusion and self-deception that because of their goodness, everything was okay between them and God. They recognized no sin. They needed no savior. And that is always the danger of morality. Morality creates an illusion of safety when in fact a person who is moral may be in the greatest danger of all. If we are to live in the light of Easter, if we are to live in the light of Easter, we must start with the sin that dwells within us all. And in case you didn't realize that the Bible says that sin is pretty bad, well, it's not just pretty bad, it will be the death and the destruction of us all. So what do we do? What do we do? In his little commentary on 1 John, John Stott writes, the proper Christian attitude to sin is not to deny it, but to admit it. And this is a very good summary of a worthy biblical word called repentance. Repentance, that seems like a good word to start our understanding of Christianity. Repentance. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. We don't do ourselves any favor looking into the mirror and ignoring or reformulating the image we see there. The Bible tells us that sin separates us from God. The Bible tells us that sin wreaks havoc in our lives. The Bible tells us that sin resides in our very nature. And it doesn't matter how long we've been in the church, the Bible calls on us to repent, to confess our sin. But God just doesn't leave us to wallow in sin and self-pity. So didn't you hear the promise in verse 9? Didn't you hear the promise in verse 9? If we confess our sins, He, Jesus, is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. That's very good news. That's very good news, because sin is very bad news, the very worst news. John reminds us, my dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But, if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. The hope is that we will not sin. That's the hope. Wouldn't you like not to sin? I would very much love not to sin. But if we do, even when we do, we have a righteous one to come to our defense. Jesus Christ is our advocate, standing up for us before the Father, pleading our case with him, offering us forgiveness. And if we only knew the depth of this forgiveness, we might shudder, shudder at the depth of our sin. 1 John 2.2 2 states this, He, Jesus, is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now, I find atoning sacrifice to be a very poor translation of the Greek word hilasmos. Some translations use the word propitiation. Anyone have, have this verse memorized and propitiation is the word that comes to mind? I find propitiation to be the better option, but of course it's that big word everybody reads and they scratches their head. What is propitiation? It's a weighty word, very weighty word. Behind it is the idea of appeasement. It was a word that was used by the ancient Greeks to describe sacrifices that were offered to angry gods to calm them, to appease their anger, to make them happy. And I think this is why some translators, they just don't like it. It makes God seem like an impetuous child who needs treats to make him less angry. 
But when the ancient rabbis made the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, this was the word they chose, propitiation. It's the word they chose to describe the character and the action of God, his wrath, and his appeasement. God is a God of wrath. We should not forget that, ignore that. We should not deny that. He is not capricious. That is, he's not doling out his wrath without, without reason. He gave us his good and holy and perfect law, didn't he? He charged us with obeying it, and we chose not to. In fact, we chose to do the exact opposite, not once, not twice, but on a daily basis. And the only way we could approach God was to obey his law, but we've fallen short. We've sinned. And sin cannot exist in God's presence. Sin cannot exist in God's good world. God's wrath is against this horrible, horrible sin. It must be destroyed. God does not have wrath at sin without reason. In Leviticus chapter 17, right, the most unread book of the Bible, the book of Leviticus. Well, Leviticus chapter 17 is very important. Leviticus chapter 17, God offers a way to take care of of that problem. The Day of Atonement. Yom Kippur, if you've heard that before. Day of Atonement. A sacrifice of propitiation was offered on behalf of the whole people to atone for their sin, to appease God's wrath, to turn away his anger so that he could embrace the sinful people he loved so much he would do anything to be near them. Now, St. John says that Jesus is our propitiation. Jesus is our propitiation. God was pleased, God was happy to have Jesus suffer and die. It made him happy to watch his son suffer and die. Jesus is the sacrifice that turns aside God's wrath, that pleases him, that he may embrace us because our sin is covered by the blood of Jesus. It's been paid for by his death. And the sacrifice of propitiation that was offered year after year, a bull and a goat, the author of Hebrew tells us it's inadequate. It was only a shadow of the greater sacrifice to come. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 10 says it's impossible, possible, for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. There needed to be a once and for all sacrifice. And Jesus, right? Hebrews chapter 4, our great high priest. Jesus, who's our great high priest, he became our great sacrifice. He laid himself on the altar. He died the death we deserved, and God was pleased to have him die on our behalf. We may be dirty, filthy sinners, rotten to the core, but God would do anything to get us back. He would offer his own son on the altar, not only for our sins, but the sins of the whole world. I'm quite serious when I say this is the greatest news that could be told. Wouldn't you agree? It's worthy of shouting in the streets. This is something we just can't keep to ourselves, or if we keep it to ourselves, that's almost a sin in and of itself. If we realize how sinful we are, if we've experienced the, death, the depth of the forgiveness that was purchased for us in Jesus Christ, we must tell someone, we must testify, we must proclaim isn't this how John starts his letter? That which was from the beginning, which we've heard, which we've seen with our eyes, which we've looked at, and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we've seen it, we testify to it, we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We haven't touched Jesus. I haven't held his hand. I haven't ate and drank with him, but John has, and he can do nothing more than to testify and to proclaim to us what he knows to be the truth. What he calls the word of life. And the question is, maybe a question I've been asking time and again, who, who have we told about this? Who needs to hear this proclamation from you? Ever since the passing of Billy Graham, everyone's been saying, we need another Billy Graham. Can I be honest with you? We don't need another Billy Graham. 
We don't need another Billy Graham. We need a church that testifies. We need a church that proclaims. We need a church that is finally willing to step up and shape up and stop relying on the Billy Grahams to do the job they should have been doing all along. And I know what your excuse is going to be. Well, pastor, I don't have the spiritual gift of evangelism. Well, that's okay, because there is no spiritual gift of evangelism. There are those who are specifically called to be evangelists, but evangelism is the responsibility of all the sinners and saints in Christ's holy church. Who here believes that Christianity is the truth? Well, tell somebody. Missionary Leslie Newbegin states this in his book, The Gospel in a Pluralist Society. Leslie Newbegin was, he was an Anglican missionary in India. And when he finally retired from the mission field, he came back to England and never felt like he left the mission field. He said, what I was doing in India, we have to do here right now. And this is what he states. When I say I believe, I am not merely describing an inward feeling or experience. I am affirming what I believe to be true and therefore what is true for everyone. The test of my commitment to this belief will be that I am ready to publish it, to share it with others, and to invite their judgment and, if necessary, correction. If I refrain from this exercise, if I try to keep my belief as a private matter, it is not belief in the truth. The more I read that statement, the more I'm just convicted. Convicted. And it's modern evangelism that's got us in to this mess that we're in. As I've been saying all along, the decline in church attendance and the nearly 10,000 churches that close each year. Did you know 10, nearly 10,000 churches close each year? That's not Billy Graham's fault. It's the fault of churches that forgot what their message was and why they should proclaim it. If we're only telling people, if we're only telling people that they need a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, well, that's great. I can do that on my own. Why do I need the church? Do we see why maybe this shouldn't be our message? Do we see why this is an inadequate understanding that may have caused us more harm than it has helped? John's message was to expose the reality of sin, to call us to repentance and confession, to announce to us the gospel, the forgiveness of sin through the propitiation of Jesus Christ, to encourage us to testify and proclaim. That is supposed to be our message. And why do we testify to that truth? John says, we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. Our joy, our joy is complete when our proclamation when our testimony brings others into our fellowship, into the fellowship that we have with the Father and the Son, then our joy is complete. There's a world out there that is waiting to hear. So testify, proclaim, live in the light of Easter. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, We confess to you. We should confess to you. John calls on us to confess to you our inadequacies, our disobedience. Lord, we confess to you the times we realize we should have told people and we didn't. We confess to you how we've misunderstood what our message should be. We confess to you that we are but sinful people. Lord, we thank you. That you love sinful people. You love them enough. You sent your son to die for them. And it made you happy. It made you glad to see your son suffer and die on our behalf. It boggles our mind. And this is the message we have for the world. Lord. 
Help us to see the depth of it, to, to experience it fully to the point where we can't help but tell others. So we thank you, Lord, that you've saved us, you've rescued us, you've ransomed us. We thank you that you trust us to carry this message to the world. Use us, we ask. Guide us by your Holy Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.